So I am the first person in my family to have education past 16, which is quite a big thing. And arrived in London with five pounds in my pocket, that you could do this, yeah. in 19, 1994, five pounds in my pocket. Moved in with a man, a pensioner, who sold pens and was a Latin American dancing champion, who rented me a very cheap bedroom in Labrick Grove. And I decided I was gonna make my fortune. And I was temping for a day because their PA was sick. And the woman that ran it was called Annie Swift. Oh, she had this thing called a pashmina that she used to throw over her shoulder. And she controlled this whole floor of people. And she was slightly ginger looking. And I was like, that's what I want to be. I didn't necessarily realise how much discrimination I was getting because I was raised to be a fighter. I was always told it was going to be tougher. I was always told that it was going to always be a battle to get forwards. Mm. Like my dad used to drop me at school every morning and go sock it to him kid or whatever happens and number two the place i was at employed katie hopkins and i thought fuck that shit i am very excited about the guest today her name is ali ali is an award-winning activist and founder of brixton finishing school ali is a digital leader with over 25 years of tenure in the media and advertising industry her previous roles include Guardian News and Media, Unruly, Mail Online, Yahoo, the list goes on. Ali has also worked on an award-winning campaigns like Life of Pi and even Dove Prism. Ali regularly speaks on bravery, the business benefits of diversity and untapped imposter syndrome. I'm super excited to welcome Ali to the show. Welcome to the show, Ali. Thank you so much. Let's start by um, knowing a bit more about you. Uh, and the first question I want to ask you is, what's your origin story? What's your background? Oh, well, as I'm 51 this year, that could take up the whole podcast. Because there's a time. lot of years to go through. However, I'll give you a highlights reel. Um, shall I say what I currently am? Yes. And then rewind. So I'm currently the founder of Brixton Finishing School and the Academy, which are award-winning employability programs that get structurally excluded talent into the creative marketing and advertising industries. But I started out as a little redhead kid on the south coast of Britain in a very sort of like, what can I say? I'm not, I don't wanna use the word poor, but it was kind of a, a kind of forgotten town on the south coast. Um, yeah, so I have got a bit of a story about how I got from outside Portsmouth, if anybody knows Portsmouth, love the sea, to here. So I am the first person in my family to have education past 16, which is quite a big thing. And my dad was an central heating apprentice. My mum was a, a kind of secretary. So your classic kind of normal, I suppose what you'd call working class. But yeah. I, know, I always thought I was very posh because where I was, I was considered posh compared to the people around right. me. Uh, went to uni. Um, and that's when I think my origin story begins. I got mm. to uni and nobody in my family had got that far before. And everybody else seemed to have some kind of rule book about how to behave. Like when uni was coming to an end, people were going to these things called milk rounds. I honestly thought it was a milkman. <laughs> I honestly did. The same way when I went to see this doctor at uni and it turned out he was a professor. I had a really sore throat and I was looking for some medicine. And that's, that's, that's not the kind of doctor that prescribes. So there was a huge gap between my inherited and born experience yep. and this educational experience. So anyway, left you, graduated from uni, did it, first person in the family, hooray for me, um, and arrived in London with five pounds in my pocket, that you could do this, yep. in 19, 1994, five pounds in my pocket, moved in with a man, a pensioner, who sold pens and was a Latin American dancing champion who rented me a very cheap bedroom in Labrick Grove. And I decided I was going to make my fortune. Uh, but the only thing I knew how to do was type because I didn't understand how to get a graduate job because nobody I knew would have got a graduate job. So very quickly, I sort of started doing little temping secretarial gigs and this whole new world would open up to me. Like I'd go into an office and I'd be like, wow, for a start, it's an office. I'd only ever worked in Mackey D's and places like that. Very right. different. Yeah. But one day I was sent into a publishing office 
And it was like this other world, like my horizon just lifted and it was packed with loads of exciting looking people. Mm. But most importantly, it was a title called Marketing Week and I was temping for a day because their PA was sick. And the woman that ran it was called Annie Swift. Oh, she had this thing called a pashmina that she used to throw over her shoulder and she controlled this whole floor of people and she was slightly ginger looking. And I was like, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to be. So that's my origin in the sense I had somebody who, you know, I was finding my own way quite clumsily, probably without any compass. And I suddenly had a moment of seeing somebody that I was like, I want to be in that direction. I, I can uh, actually relate to that story. I grew up in India and I actually uh, grew up in the slums in India. Oh. And, you know, my, my father, my parents worked really hard to get us out of it. Yeah. And, you know, when I, I had a similar kind of moment when, you know, I came to the UK and, you know, I walked into the uni and it was like, hmm, I made it. Uh, again, similar to you, like, uh, it's a bit different, maybe. Like, my, my dad did go to uni. Uh, but nobody had gone abroad to study and it was like a big deal and it was my granddad's dream for one of Mm. us uh, one of his grandkids to go abroad and study and it was like it it was nothing uh, nothing um, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or any of the Russell group but it was just a normal uni but it was a big deal for us right Mm. similar similarly like you know what you said and experience right when you think about sort of your career after you 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 said okay well I'm going to be that person the pashmina mm-hmm. and all that experience <laughs> what, what did you experience in your first you know 10 20 years i know we've spoken about yeah. this the discrimination the ad industry the creative industry the very one-sided uh yeah. type of people the diversity and so on tell mm-hmm. us a bit more about that experience i think it's put it put it into context as well that i was used to a lot of resistance to me succeeding I, am, I think it's like you can talk about discrimination and there is certainly discrimination mm-hmm. against the socially mobile and obviously from a gender point of view yeah. and neurodiverse point of view. Obviously, I'm Caucasian. You may have guessed that at the beginning when I said I was uh, ginger. So obviously, it's very possible to have redheads of all wonderful sorts. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think, yes, I didn't necessarily realise how much discrimination I was getting because I was raised to be a fighter. I was always told it was going to be tougher. I was always told that it was going to always be a battle to get forwards. Mm. Like my dad used to drop me at school every morning and go, sock it to him, kid, and whatever happens. You know, so I think I probably only became cognizant of what I was experiencing after a couple of years in, because I was so used to things being a fight. But from a class perspective, I'd always thought, because I'd got in and I was doing really well in this advertising career, that people saw me as I saw them, which is a very naive statement. Again, could be due to my neurodiversity. And it was only when people were really obvious about Mm. stuff did I sense the discrimination. I didn't pick up, I don't really pick up on hidden cues. Mm. So an example of that is when I was at a big newspaper and I was going to see a very posh fashion client. And I took the fashion manager, who was actually probably indirectly lower down the organogram than me uh, and a couple of people you know i'd arranged the meeting it's my account so it's mine yep. you know it's quite high, high up the tree and she checked my bag to see if it was fake before we went in didn't check anybody else's just mine and i you know suddenly thought oh my god but my best one is the girl that went to school with prince charles <laughs> which says everything about the right. kind of people in the industry doesn't it so I didn't realise I was the token working class person. I was completely right. blind to that because I thought I was posh. You have to remember where I grew up, I was considered mm. posh. I am not posh, I've realised. But that's what I'd imprinted yeah. On, yeah. on myself because I got. I know I was getting educated. I was going to go past 16 at school. I was one of the posh people. Right. Right. So when I entered these spaces, I thought I was one of them didn't realize they like all of them knew I wasn't mm. and the um yeah so a new girl joined my team at this paper and she didn't speak to me for a week and I said to one of my colleagues why isn't so and so speaking to me and she went well Ali she's never met anybody like you has she and I was like oh 
And I suddenly realised that whereas I thought I was just one of them, yeah. they didn't think I was one of them at all. <laughs> you know, it takes me back to my early, early days in the UK, mm. especially when I got my first job. And I was so thankful for the opportunity, mm. right? I was just so excited, like, oh my God, I got a job and it's in the marketing. That's what I studied. And I was just so excited that you're just sort of almost like shut everything else. Yeah. Even if it's discrimination or whatever else, mm. negative. You just shut it because you're like, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to focus, I'm going to win, and I'm yeah. going to be successful. I don't care. But actually, what you don't realize is you need to pay attention to all yeah. of that because those are the blocks that you need to go over. Yeah. And if you don't realize it, you might succeed slowly, but it's not going to be the same track as the others. Yeah, right? I completely echo what you're saying. I'd got where I'd got on incredible self-driven will. Yeah. Uh, and that was my one strategy. I will work harder. I will bear more. Mm. I will do more. Yeah. And that's fine because that controls your aspect. But because you're so in that, it doesn't take into account the fact that other people are in your way. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. Obviously, gender was massive as well. Bear in mind, I came into the industry in the early 90s, you know, yeah. which... Um, Very skewed well, to men. Well, 60 men yeah. on the floor and three girls at one of the papers mm. I was at. And, yeah, you know, regu regularly blatant what would now mm. be tribunal stuff going on yeah. regularly. And even, you know, when I had my daughter, I'm a single parent, I was the first woman at my workplace ever to even get flexible hours. And that was only because I ran such a big book of business. Right. They had to, you know, yeah, had to I think this keep is, me. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is the bit that almost kind of worries you, right? That you have to go above and beyond to be noticed. Yeah. To get that... Or to keep the job. Or That's keep the job. That's how I felt. I felt if I don't do 110% every day, no. I'm out. And right. there is no safety net for me. Right. Nobody's going to pay my rent, so... We had uh, we had someone, uh, one of the guests earlier in the episode, uh, uh, in the show, and they talked about body image and mm. being conscious of that. And, you know, they said that, you know, they're on the bigger size and they always thought that they had to compensate um, through their IQ and their work and they had to always do extra hours mm. to just figure, like, just kind of see, get people to see that, oh, yeah, you don't look a certain type because that's what they expected. Yeah. But actually, you're a really good worker. And it's like, hmm, what? no, you don't have to do that. What, like, where is equity in this? But this is, I think it's so interesting how, as well, that I completely identify that you internalise and that you have to solve yourself as if you are the problem. Right. That's not the case, no. is it? It's the structure that's the problem. Yeah. But what the structure is very good at doing is making us feel lesser than mm. and us having to compensate rather than maybe going, I don't need to do anything extra. You lot need to do the extra work yeah. on yeah. how you view me. Right. Which obviously I would say we're much nearer to now, but at the beginning of, of my journey, I wasn't even capable of understanding that concept. Yeah, yeah. So your journey, you know, obviously ad industry, marketing, all of that, and hmm. then what made you switch to Brixton finishing, finishing school? school? Well, number one, my daughter hit 11, so I didn't have to pay the second mortgage that is childcare, <laughs> yeah. so I could take a risk. And number two, the place I was at employed Katie Hopkins. And I thought, fuck that shit. Yeah? yeah. So Katie, sorry, you can de you can probably beat that out. But Katie Hopkins, if we're not aware of her, is an alt-right yeah. kind of commentator. And she's written some very, what I view as hate speech around, you know, people from different countries. Um, she has written some really horrible things about people that aren't true. And I just had a moment of clarity that I was running a very big revenue line mm -hmm. into this, uh, you know, I was running a big advertising budget in. So I was kind of indirectly paying her salary mm. or contributing to it. And when I was younger, have you ever been to see Les Miserables? Les Miserables, right, is this French musical. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, Les Mis. Uh, so when you're at school, you get to normally go to see two musicals, yeah. Blood Brothers and Les Mis. We right. were banned from Blood Brothers at my school quite shortly after they came on stage. Right. Les Mis, we did manage to sit through without causing a riot. And there's this brilliant scene at the end, this is relevant, where there's like this whole load of people from the arrondissement, which is the district of Paris. 
that have kind of rebelled, some men, women and children, on this big barricade. And they're all going, liberty, equality, whatever. And then obviously loads of soldiers come along and shoot them. Now, when I grew up, I was definitely on the barricades. I was, I know, mm. I was very active politically. To survive in this industry, I drifted off the barricade, kept my nose clean, but for want of a better word, because you're not allowed to put your head above the parapet if you're from a group that isn't, you know, hasn't got a significant majority. <laughs> and I suddenly realised that I was now in a position where I may not have been firing, but I was paying for the bullets. You know, and going back to Katie Hopkins, the relevancy is I just couldn't be complicit in a structure mm. with somebody pub writing hate speech about communities I cared about. Yeah. So I stepped out and decided I would initially, and this shows the insanity of being neurodiverse maybe sometimes, in my head I was like, right, I'm going to set up a project that finds talent from structurally excluded communities. I live on a council estate in Dalston. People on my street can get firsts, they won't get a job because they don't know anybody. And connects those kind of talents with our industry. Mm. Uh, bear in mind, I had no experience in this. I had no money apart from Amex, which I could max out. And I was a single mother who uh, has one sole income, mine. So, yeah, luckily I had the idea. I hand drew a logo and I went round people who I knew may be sympathetic and amazingly, over my 25, 30 year career, I hadn't upset as many people as I thought I had. And people like McCann London, Visium, Clear Channel, Pretty Green, and very, you know, a couple of other amazing yeah. companies seed funded me. Um, and then I worked like two jobs. But again, if you're from my background, you know, I used to have three jobs. Right. You know, we can do 100 hour weeks. You know, now I'm knackered. I can't do it. But back when I was in my 20s, I regularly did a next second or third job. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And we launched Brixton in 2018 with 24 students. This year, we'll have probably 103,000 people in the UK wow. participating in one of our many programs. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. When you when you look at when you looked at the so you decided to switch right to Brixton and yeah. start that project. What were the core challenges that you saw? Of course, like, you know, the the structure, as you said, like the socially excluded yeah. or the neuro neurodiverse. But if you look at that whole group as a whole, what are the real challenges that they're facing yeah. today, the youth? Well, I think there's three. In terms of getting into the industry, marketing and advertising, yeah. one is awareness because it's such an elite industry and the legacy of recruiting in that industry tends to populate around elitist centres. The majority of people in the UK don't think it's an avenue open to them or that even that it's a massive industry that's worth billions. You know, the creative industries, we're, well, we were number one in Europe and fourth in the world. But, you know, when Debut, the graduate app, did a survey, uh, one in three graduates said, oh, there's no money in an advertising job. You know, if you can't see that there's gravy, yeah. why would you bother? Second is attainability. You only have to look at the spaces. How do I get in? It's these glossy, big London buildings like Google or Spotify. Yeah. You think, oh, you forget that it's full of humans just like you. But because it's not demystified, that becomes a massive leap, especially in the current housing crisis where yeah. if you're not going to let young people work remotely, you, they have to relocate to the southeast in majority. We're very pro, you know, having a national footprint for our business and organisation so you've got huge amounts of challenge there so even if you know about it you've got the courage to get in how do you get in well 60 mm. percent of roles aren't advertised so it's about accessibility so we've built this um pipeline based on digital marketing that's very much about unpicking each one of those barriers and kind of creating what we call an equitable super highway in which is working yeah we placed, I think it was 142 people last year, despite the recruitment freezes. So that's Amazing. pretty good. Amazing, yeah. <clears throat> the thing is, like, every time I hear this, and I know about this from before, mm. it amazes me because because there's a, I can see the real problem in the yeah. industry, but not many people are actively doing this, the companies itself. Mm. And so you need, you need this external 
entity like yourselves to yeah. come and say, actually, no, you're not doing this right. You should also be considering, you know, these people, they are talented yeah. and they're amazing people. And we need that, you know, the diversity regardless of what, what yeah. you're doing, right, in the ad industry. There's multiple areas within the ad industry, right? And I, I again, like, maybe this was me kind of naive as well. Like, when I uh, landed a job at Google, I was, like, I, I, I really love my job. I love the company. I love the people I work with. Uh, Big shout out to Google <laughs> today. Thank you. Have you. Is your bonus coming up? Is that why you're saying? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, but again, like it was, it was like not not on my radar. It was like hmm, it's too hard to achieve this. Like yeah. maybe I'm not deserving of this. It's re that imposter syndrome yeah. haunted me for years, mostly when I was in corporate structures, and right. I've shook it off since I've decided to step out of that structure, and make up my own rules. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out, yeah, I'm best with my own rules, yeah. not other people's. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So we've talk, you've mentioned neurodiversity a few times. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit more about your yeah. neurodiversity challenge and what do you see with you know the youth that you work with? And, and then more importantly, like how does society or the companies that you work with need to like be more welcoming? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I am a light, late diagnosis ADHD though anybody who went to school with me would probably say that, you know, now it's blindingly obvious. Right. So I find it physically painful to sit still if I don't want to. And at school, I was either extremely disruptive or a brilliant genius, one of the two. So it all depends whether I wanted to be there or not, really. Yeah. But I didn't have any control over that. So I got A's or U's. Yeah. It was quite a polarised stuff. Um. So I've always found it in corporate situations, I've had to learn how to mask a lot, which mm. I think is very common. Number one, I don't think, especially amongst women, women are diagnosed. Uh, certainly in my generation, nobody was diagnosed. You were just difficult. You were just difficult. Just difficult, yeah. And actually, you're not difficult. You're just thinking in a different mm. way. And I have to, I've had to have done a lot of work in corporate life to train myself mm. to act in a neurotypical manner example I, I if I can I can get to a solution on something really really quickly because I can pro seemingly process multiple things pieces of information at once I'm always amazed right at, at the, the slowness that's another pro a typical could take that sounds like a superpower it is a superpower yeah. but at the same time at the same time um yeah I can, you know I can't be asked with detail a lot of the time unless it's interesting so my superpower is the ability to see things that, in a different way, thus Brixton. My other superpower is the ability to not see barriers. That's quite common in my type. But with that comes the ability to burn out as well. Yeah, because I, yeah. Yeah, because you keep going, right? Keep going, keep mm. going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Um, and also masking. I mean, I, I'm very privileged now that I run my own thing. Right. So I do stuff in a way so I get up early I do a lot of work in the morning I'll always do some exercise I'll always start the day with meditation I have a nap to reset my brain and I'll do a bit more work that keeps me an optimum mm. in a corporate environment you know, I'd, it's, you know it's just on. horrendous yeah. so, boy yeah. it's physically painful and you get like a kind of burning I, I could mm. describe it like bats in my brain Arr! right yeah the young people we work with, so uh, funding-wise, I've always wanted to do a neurodiverse version of Brixton. And in fact, just before COVID, we were looking I, looking at spaces. I'd been potentially given a space in Canary Wharf to fit out as a autism-friendly office. Because wow. obviously the typicals, you can't see what how privileged you are unless you go. And this, you know... This is what the world actually would look like if I chose it, right. you know. Um, yeah, because I think for me, things like I'm very sound sensitive. I'm very light sensitive. Um, you know, meetings can't go over 45 minutes for me. I'm probably, you know, I'm very well trained now at the grand age of nearly 51. 
not to interrupt as much as I used to. Mm. But that was really hard to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously I'm not, well, I'm in diagnosis, so we don't know what blend I am. Mm. But we presume it's ADHD. Yeah. I went to a Diverse Minds conference, and this is how I found out. I went to a conference on neurodiversity, and one of the world's leading experts on ADHD, after chatting to me in the coffee area, said, so when did you get your diagnosis? And I said, what? <laughs> they went, well, you've got ADHD, haven't you? I was like, do I? Wow. And that's how we started the journey. And everybody since that, they'd always, everybody had said, you've got ADHD. But I'd always thought that was just because I was full of energy. Yeah. Yeah. It's one way to find out, I guess. Yeah. So for me, I mean, there's some really good employers like WPP mm. do amazing neurodiversity training. Mm. Um, and so there's some some people who are doing loads to include people. And what was beautiful this summer on one of our courses, we asked our students if they feel comfortable to declare. A lot of them don't. But after a session with like the biggest agent, you know, WPP this summer, a young man sort of declared that he was. He said, I felt ashamed. Now I don't. It is a superpower. And he's gone on to have, you know, he placed him at Channel 4. So, Amazing, yeah. Yeah. So I think for me, I wouldn't have got to where I am today without it. Mm. What would have been easier is more understanding of it. People can get mm. very irritated with somebody who's fidgety. Yeah, there's like three things that sort of I learned from what you just said. One is that you, you shouldn't be ashamed. God, uh, no. It's, you might have it, you might not have it. It doesn't matter. Like mm. If you have it, then that's fine. Uh, second one is that people around you, uh, whether it's the company or friends or whoever, they need to, they need to be able to embrace it. Mm. and be okay and maybe even change some of their own you're ways, having to embrace right? their typicalness right yeah every day so you're having ways. to compensate mentally for their way of thinking right. why should you not get the same respect yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> and the third one is which is a, a actually a hard one so you know like for example if someone is less able physically you can see it right mm. but this can be quite hard yeah. unless you explicitly say it right or someone has told them that actually you know Danish or Ali in your case yeah uh, this so then how do you how do you like how like if I if you didn't tell me I wouldn't know I now we just you assume wouldn't. you're super energetic so yeah. how would you advise someone to be an ally for you but you have to remember I present in the way of somebody that's been able to op operate it for 30 mm. years you know i've become very adapted sure so the reason i can present in the way i do is because that's what kept mm. me in a job back mm. in the days when this wasn't something yeah. people accepted right um i would say if you've done the right training and there's lots of it about it's quite you can spot people but it's also creating a safe space for people to actually be yeah. themselves. Nobody is truly typical. We are yeah. all on a scale. Right. One of the best papers I ever read on it was this paper called Dr. Helen Taylor. She wrote a paper called Complementary Cognition mm. that shows there's like a kind of like band. One end is explore. The other one is like perfect. So mm. Broadly, ADHD and autism. Right. Everybody's on that band. But when you look at all the great innovations in the world, yeah. they've come from either end. Either, yeah. They haven't come from the it's middle. So true. So, you know, I would definitely, and certainly in the creative industries, we mm. have a much higher percentage mm. of people who yeah. present. Um, you, know, we, you know, but that's partly because of what yeah. we do. Yeah, because we're a bit more liberal, I think. It's, it's almost that, we need to coach people to work with neurodiverse people, but also coach people who are neurodiverse to be okay with their neurodiversity. Yeah. Right? And then second one is the whole psychological safety, right? That, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed I've got this. Yeah. Right? Uh, and it could go even further. Like imagine if you're a women person of color with neurodiversity, yeah. it's just layers of discrimination, well, the right? Yeah. It's just too much. Yeah. So how do you then feel psychological safety if no no one is embracing it or even listening or trying well, to, to find, come halfway? Yeah, I just sort of think you have to find somewhere that's doing the work. Mm. It's not up to you to, you know, all of us obviously are advocating for change. Well, I am. I'm saying yeah. all of us, you know, some people are. Mm -hmm. But the reality is one of the biggest learnings is it's not your responsibility. It's the people the responsibility who hold yeah. the power. Yeah. They should be sorting their stuff out. Yeah. 
Um, and the blessing of neurodiversity is it doesn't matter whether you're rich, it doesn't matter if you went to Eton, you could be neurodiverse. Right. So I found it really interesting that when, you know, I talk about, you know, if you're white, socially mobile, if you're from a multi-ethnic background, some people get on board with that. Yeah? Mm. When you talk about neurodiversity, a whole population, normally of the quite posh people, go, well, that is something I'm interested in because so-and-so, mm. you know, my nephew or my cousin, right. you know, because that's their first experience, yeah. apart from ageism, which gets us all, of actually what it's like to yeah. see somebody discriminated against. Right. Uh, because they've been kind of closeted from a certain amount of mm. cold wind. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's their yeah. first um, the experience of it. So if I kind of step back and going back to the, the entire group that, you know, Brixham Finishing mm. School is trying to help, uh, whether it's neurodiversity yeah. or socially excluded or diverse, yeah. you know, broadly diverse. Is there hope? Do you see positives in the industry? Yeah, do you know what I do? Because let's face it, I'm in year six and I've now got a team of 15 and we've gone, you know, we've got a much bigger footprint yeah. and I've got 54 partners. Now, six years ago, people weren't even having these conversations as nuanced mm. as they were. And obviously the awful murders that continue in America were a kind of watershed moment around this as well, as have lots of other things been. But the reality is, you know, I think the industry's recognised that you cannot create marketing and advertising without including the communities you sell to in it. Um, all of the financial reporting, like McKinsey, if you've got a diverse team, 33% likely to make more money. Mm. You know, there's a really, you know, there's like the other day I was reading an article in the business press which showed that if you have a diverse leadership team your your team works 12 percent harder the people below you Easy. now when we're in a kind of you know we're in a bit of a tight spot at the moment if i could get 12 percent more product productivity out of my business i would be optimizing yeah. using a very digital marketing phrase yeah. immediately to do that yet yeah, we as you know the one thing we should be optimizing is for our kind of businesses to win the population of this country has changed dramatically. The blend of our citizenship right. has never been more diverse, and that is a blessing. But if you want to market to a whole range of consumers, you've got to wake up and involve all those consumers in it. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. You are a force for good. <laughs> you are an inspiration, and I, I love the energy. But I have to, you know, sort of, if I were to ask you again, yeah. uh, which is... If you were, you know, young again, the young oh, Ali, God. 16, 18, 20, you know, looking at that uh, lady with Pashmina. Yeah. What would, advice would you give to your younger self? Can I give two bits of advice? As many as you like. One, be very careful who you fall in love with because it may absolutely screw you up. Right. That's not, you know, I've been very lucky. But um, who you choose to have in your life as friends and, fam and sort of a life partner will dramatically affect your outcomes. So don't put up with anything less than you being treated really well. Number two, you know, one of the biggest things I had was just blind resilience. And I think sometimes that's what you need. Yeah, just to get through. It's not you, it's them. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it can be you if you turn up late and you're taking the piss. But most of the time, if you're from a community, <laughs> Yeah, it may, you know, a lot of the time you will find something, you'll internalise why things aren't going your way. Yeah. Before you do that, ask yourself the question, could it be the structure, not me? And if it is, then chat to a mentor, or chat to a, you know, if you've got an employment resource group, if you've got people from a community that you resonate with, share that experience to kind of normalise what you're feeling. Because most of the time it isn't you, it is the structure. Incredible. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all the amazing stuff. <laughs> and I wish you even more success with Brixton. Oh, thank you. Thank well, you. thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Yay! And we're out.